And I'm very happy to, to moderate this panel. We brought in some of the, um, the best speakers we could bring in from the industry. I'm sure you recognize all of these guys. Of course. Um, we're going to try to keep this very um, light and, and very informal, but also provide a lot of data and a lot of detail around how enterprises are making the transformation to DevOps. Um, one of the things that you know is really interesting about this topic is we're not really, um, you know, there's not a lot of like prescriptions you can follow. Like it's not like a two-step process or a seven-step process to go from where you're at to being more agile and being faster. And there's a lot of misnomers out there that you know you have to be a startup to do this, or if you do this, you lose your quality and you lose your your ability to do things really well. And so what I want to do is have each um, each panelist kind of introduce themselves. And real quickly, just kind of tell you what is the value of moving your enterprise to DevOps, moving your enterprise to a more agile, more fast-paced um, speed of change model. What's the value of doing that? And, and, and then we'll kind of kick it off from there. So we'll start off with Damon. All right, I get to be first? Great. Good morning, or good afternoon, or I guess it's still morning. Um, yeah, so uh, Damon Edwards, DTO Solutions, spent a lot of time helping large enterprises um, change how they work, uh, people, process, and tooling. Um, and I think, you know, uh, we don't look at it as moving to DevOps. Um, we look at it as, you know, DevOps being a community of practice that helps inform you to how to get out of your own way, how to stop, how to find the bottlenecks, the inefficiencies, things that get into your, uh, into your way in your day-to-day -day life and then in the way of your organization um, trying to get what it wants to get done. And look at DevOps as a field of practice and a series of an umbrella uh, over a series of techniques to help you remove all those things that get, that get in the way. So for us, it's about outcomes. It's about how can you actually uh, uh, move faster and be uh, and have higher quality. They used to be uh, an oxymoron. It used to be you had to pick one or the other. Slowing down was going to give us better quality. And I think what you see in the DevOps community um, and a lot of the, the practices that I think DevOps sort of encompasses, uh, you see companies able to achieve um, you know faster throughput, uh, better quality, and higher security, um, which seems like a not supposed to work that way, but it does. And I'm sure Gene is now going to give us some some facts and figures that are uh, far more interesting than that. Thanks, Damon, Ken. Yeah, my name is Gene Kim. I've been studying high-performing technology organizations since 1999, and uh, most recently I wrote a book called The Phoenix Project uh, that's a, a novel about essentially the problems that DevOps is really designed to solve. Uh, I think one of the criticisms about DevOps is that it, uh, there's no crisp definition of what it is. But for me, uh, DevOps you know, is, uh, you know, are all the sets of cultural norms technical practices uh, that are required to get this incredible fast throughput from dev through test into operations so that we're creating value for customers while preserving world-class reliability, stability, and security. Uh, but I think it's also those practices that enable organizational learning and maximizing productivity for developers, whether we're a DBA, uh, a network engineer, you know, CCIE, right? Our goal is, you know, how do we enable developer productivity uh, as measured by lead time, deployment frequency, you know, reliability measures like mean time to pair change success rate. All right. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Adrian Cockcroft. I'm a, a technologist at uh, Battery Ventures, a VC firm, where I'm basically sort of consulting with large companies and helping them understand net new gener next generation technologies, doing lots of talks at conferences, and uh, helping our, our, the startups that we invest in uh, figure out what, you know, find new customers and find interesting things to do. So I've been doing that about a year and a half, but before that you probably know me best as the uh, cloud architect for Netflix. And the, the model, the, there's sort of two different approaches to DevOps. You can either have the ops people working with the dev people and figuring out how to have common tools and common patterns and common processes. Or the, the other approach was, was the developers basically figuring out how to run everything themselves. Whoa. And then have the ops people figure out how to build APIs to, to expose IT. So basically you get sort of IT as a service or operations as a service and the platformization of, the op of what previously would be the operations layers. And then the developers running uh, basically owning stuff in production. And that's, so Netflix came at it from that point of view. And these techniques all meet in the middle, but there's different mixes of them in different organizations. So, 
Thanks, Adrian. Uh, my name is Mitchell Hashimoto. I'm the founder of HashiCorp, uh, most well known as the creator of Vagrant, um, if you use that, but also some other projects, uh, Packer, Console, Terraform, uh, Vault. And um, those, those projects are used by some of the biggest websites uh, in the world. So our, we sort of approach uh, DevOps from a, from a technology perspective. We try to come in with the goal of improving um, the speed at which you could get from development to deployment, but doing it safely, doing it repeatedly, and that inevitably bleeds in very much into process um, and culture and those sorts of things. Um, so from my point of view, I view it uh, from a more tools side of things, um, but I, that's not to downplay the importance of all the, the culture and process as well. Great. Thanks, Mitchell. So. Um, what I want to kind of do is start off with, with one question, and, and we'll probably, you know, so we could probably spend the entire day talking about this question, but we'll, I'll try to keep it, I'll try to keep the discussion going, but um, I think a lot of enterprises feel like they believe they know what the value is of moving to this model, but when you guys all have great experience in working with companies that are going through this transformation, and I just want you to kind of, I'll start with Adrian, and then, you know, whoever wants to jump in can jump in after Adrian, but I want to just kind of spend a few minutes um, talking about what is it that are the what are the obstacles that they've faced that if they've overcome, what are the obstacles that they face that they have a hard time trying to overcome because of, of different reasons, and you know we'll start with Adrian and then all of all of you guys if you want to jump in please do and and start you can like kind of make fun of each other too if you want you know that's, oh that's trust okay. me we will <laughs> all right um, so if you if you're starting this process there's. The, the transformation. There's a lot of people trying to do this and the, the, the first thing is why are you doing it and it really comes down to, I think I saw, saw a quote from the keynotes yesterday of this event that 40% of enterprises won't exist in, some, in a few years. Um, you're, you're trying not to be in that 40% bucket, right? <laughs> The people that don't figure out how to develop things more quickly and, and stay competitive are going to be the 40% that die out in a few years, and the 60%, if that's the right number, but you know, the people that survive are the people that figure out how to be competitive in this space. So that means that you, it used to be okay to do a yearly release, and then it became okay to do a quarterly release, and then you get people doing sort of weekly or bi-weekly agile stuff and think, okay, I, I can just about get there. And now you find that the state of the art is daily or continuous delivery, where people are doing hundreds of releases a day to SaaS-based environments. And what, you, what happens when you get to that is you start learning about your customers, the markets, and the technologies you're using continuously every day, instead of learning something, you know, maybe it takes you six months or a year to discover this technology doesn't work. That's a problem. Whereas if you're trying something new every day, you, you learn so much more quickly that you become more competitive. And that, that's, the, that's what's really driving this from a, a business point of view. The problem to get there is it doesn't mean you just kind of you know, have, a, have a, a shared lunch between the dev people and the ops people or rename your QA group as the DevOps group. That's not what we're talking about, you know, buy a few tools. It, the problem is, as you, get a, as you figure out what's really needed here, in many cases it requires a reorg. Yeah, it maybe takes six to nine months to get everyone in management to agree what this reorg looks like, but in most cases, it's kind of a 90 degree shift to the, to the way that companies are laid out. And it's quite often a shift from, produce, from a project-based workload, where everyone forms a project, you deliver the project, and then you go to the next project, to a product-based mentality, where you own a product for its entire lifetime, and you're continuously evolving it. So that sense of responsibility for a product, typically a web service, but, but that kind of idea that you are continuously evolving a product is a very different model. And you still, you know, you move the resources around as products mature, maybe they move into a more maintenance role and need different people and different things to look after them. But there's still this concept that you're trying to get away from projects and move more into products. And that means kind of you need fewer project managers and more product managers as well. So the skill sets move around a bit too. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, in the DevOps community, one of the kind of seminal presentations was given by John Allspaugh and Paul Hammond in 2009, this famous, you know, 10 deploys a day at Flickr at Velocity 2009. One of the most interesting people I met last year was a gentleman named Jim Stoneham, who actually was the general manager for the Flickr property, among uh, others, the, the Yahoo Answers property. Uh, so it was all the social uh, media 
things inside of the Yahoo mothership. And he actually told the backstory behind you know, the Flickr 10 deploys a day. Uh, in other words, he said, in the Yahoo Answers property, we were doing a one deploy every six weeks, whereas Flickr was doing 10 deploys a day. And to hear the contrast of you know, what it's like when you can only do a release or an experiment once every six weeks versus at Flickr where they could do it on demand, and he said it was very difficult for us to learn and compete against you know, organizations like Quora or Stack Exchange and so forth. And it was just a phenomenal sort of uh, contrast to hear about what, how did it feel to him as the general manager you know, when you have two very different uh, profiles of organizations and how they learned. Uh, for me, that was just a, a treat. I think, I think another interesting perspective that I like to bring up is just that the technology we have today is like if a lot of these processes are back you know, just a decade old or something, but even if you go back a decade, getting servers or provisioning servers or networks or anything was a lengthy process. Um, and nowadays, just from a pure technological, uh, technological level, um, because of APIs and things like that, you could get a server or a container or configure a network or re redo firewalls within seconds. And the thing is, like at, a, at scale, at even 100, even 100 servers, people just don't move that fast. Um, so uh, in, in a lot of ways, it's like, if you continue your old processes that were working for you, what does it mean just from a pure technology perspective if your competitors are taking advantage of the fact that they can make technology move for them automatically at, at second intervals or millisecond intervals? Like, how is that going to affect the product and your ability to compete in that way? Um, so in addition to just getting customer feedback and things like that, you could just from cost savings, but even just from being able to do more interesting things uh, from the technology perspective, it, you sort of need this sort of automation and better communication to break down barriers to move faster so you can take advantage of all this stuff. That must be a really exciting presentation over there. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, if you guys want to cheer at any time, <laughs> cheer. Cheer. totally cool. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I think the question was about what gets in the way, right? The kind of, and I think this is, so everybody, what gets in the way is how things are today. I and mean, this is true in any, we, you know, we say, it, it, you know, legacy just means the history of success. You've been around long enough, you've been successful enough to become an enterprise, um, and you've had this legacy technology, tools, processes, people, uh, not just technology processes, but, you know, approval processes, governance processes, organizational, um, you know, politics, fiefdoms. And, uh, you know, as Adrian said, there is this future state you know your organization has to get into. So you see all these folks that are moving at this lightning speed, and you go, we want to look more like that. But you say, this is what we look like today. And, you know, what is it today? And how it's set up today is also it reinforces that, which is, you know, everything's very siloed, right? We put like with like. We have, you know, five different networking teams because they're all specialists. We have a database team. We have a storage team, platform team, different development teams, QA teams. Uh, you know, support teams, knock teams. So we get all these teams everywhere, and we basically created these request queues to govern their lives. And what ends up happening is everybody's working out of context. You only see this little part of your world, right? And the work has to somehow make its way through all of those processes. Um, it's sort of like I was, it was described to me the other day as uh, remember the game of life? When, you know, you spin the wheel and you're the car and you got to go all the way through it. Well, half the people are trying to be those people, trying to get something done, and you're passing through the Game of Thrones, all these different fiefdoms of where people are, you know, have these, their world. And they're, they're, everyone's trying to do the best for the organization, but you have this mismatch. And you see, that's what organizations are struggling with today. And, you know, the number one, it sounds so simple, but the number one way to counteract that is making the work visible. You know, rarely does anybody actually know what does it take to get something through that entire life cycle. And have we ever actually put that on the board? and gotten the stakeholders together at the same time and say, you know, dev, ops, product, security, uh, QA, you know, all their functional responsibilities, do, are we all on the same page as to what it actually happens and in, in, in take place today? And then from that, you can start removing those wastes and start to evolve yourself to look more and more like those, uh, you know, next generation organizations. And then once you get a handle on that, then you can start thinking about what is the new model that everyone wants to, wants to be working under. Because if you just jump to, oh, we need a new organizational model, you know, people tend to just recreate the old with new, uh, with new titles. So not to pimp out my own talk, but that's going to be a lot of what we're we talking about today, mm -hmm. like Re15, I think it is. But uh, to me, that's, you know, if you're thinking about what gets in the way, it's always the way things are today. And unless you get a handle on how that is and what's getting in the way, making a, trying to make a jump to work like a Netflix is uh, going to seem like a leap too far. 
and uh, you know most people are going to bail out long before they they get there. This yeah. is kind of the scar tissue What's thing, that? right? You build up organizational scar tissue. Your processes uh, contain everything that ever went wrong in the right. past is a pro is a step in the process to prevent it going okay. wrong again. Right. And you and you get slower and slower and slower. And in fact, you know, there are other analogies for that. The HR manual probably contains everything that somebody did bad in your company one time. There's a law. There's a rule against it. <laughs> or the laws of the country you live in contain the things that specifically somebody did a bad thing. Right. So the difference about you know when you get to the kind of the Netflix approach or, or the or the is, is to basically clear that out. And if somebody does something bad, and kind of, instead of having a rule and a check to prevent that happening again, you tell the guy, don't do it again. And if they do do it again, you get rid of them. And that kind of feedback pressure means that people think about what they're doing and they become more responsible. And you actually have accelerated processes where people have more autonomy and they have more freedom, but they're also held responsible. And you really are held responsible. So you can screw up, but if you, if you repeatedly screw up in the same way, you shouldn't be doing that job anyway. You should be off doing something else where, where yeah. you know, you're obviously out, not in the right role. Here's a good example of that. We had a client, it's a, a very successful you know, financial services company, uh, been around for you know, decades, and uh, this was just one particular line of business. They figured out, they looked at their, uh, you know, why are things taking so long? Why was it taking months and months to do things that should take weeks to do? And everyone kept complaining about approvals. And it turned out that one organization with uh, about 1,200 people in one technology line of business, through May, the middle of May, call it May 15th, had 26,000 uh, discrete approvals that were sent to the ServiceNow system, each of those generating multiple emails. So call it 100,000 emails. And you know, some of the top people in the organizations, uh, you know, talking VP and senior vice president level, had over 1,000 emails, uh, approvals, get sent their way. And less than 1% actually got, uh, actually were rejected, which obviously just means that it's rubber stamping. Well, how'd you get there? Well, you've got this team that's there, you know, responsible, there's compliance folks talking to the change management folks, and we did something wrong at one time, so we put an approval in for that. And then everybody ignored the approval, so we put an approval on top of the approval, okay. and you just get layers of approvals on top of approvals until you're actually not approving or you're actually not protecting your organization. But why can't we get rid of it? Well, because we're a regulated industry. So everyone holds on to that folklore of this approvals are actually protecting the organization. When you look at it, it's actually undermining the organization because uh, nobody could keep, could, keep, could keep up with that. You either do one of two things. You either um, just, just you know, shunt them off to some other mailbox, and if somebody yells loud enough, you go and click on it, or you just click on approve on all of them, because there's no way you could actually even look at those and assess, especially at a vice president level, how are they going to look at an infrastructure change and tell you whether or not that was actually good, where you're the person actually doing the change, as Adrian's talking about, you should be empowered to actually um, make those decisions and see what those changes uh, would be. I know Gene's got this great story about John Alspaugh his first, you're working your first day at Oh, <laughs> Yeah, um, so John Alspaugh, from the famous Alspaugh Hammond presentation, he's now the head of tech ops at Etsy. And one of the kind of the things that I learned that actually put me on the brink of six weeks of you know, existential despair <laughs> was uh, learning how, how they dealt with you know, uh, large outages right, and chain controls. And, when, and essentially the, the phrase that sort of really threw me for a loop, especially being trained as an auditor, was hearing how Allspa does chain control. He had a new engineer at Etsy and he asked John, is it okay for me to make this change? To which we, he responded, I don't know, is it? In other words, he did not own any of the responsibility of the quality of the change. He put it squarely on the shoulders of the implementer. And so his question and response to the implementer was, you know, did you get someone to review your change? Did you, do you know who the absolute subject matter expert of categories of these changes are? Did you do everything that you could to give yourself assurance that this change is going to go into production and operate as design? And if you did, make the change, right? And if something goes wrong, We'll have a blameless postmortem, but you know, don't wait for approval, right? You know, I, you know, you, you know that's your job. So, and w one more add-on to say why that works there. Number one, I think they have the culture that Adrian was talking about, where they provide context and they trust, you know, their people. It's a whole different conversation. Uh, but you know, the notion that they don't work in isolation, that they have that end-to-end -end visibility of the system, 
the people are working out of out of context of each other, they you tend to try to rely on that approval because you don't know the end-to-end -end system. You're making a network change and you don't have any of the context of the rest of the network changes that need to happen there or the application and how it should be working or any of the other information you would have to judge that change. You have to then go and seek some external validation or approval from people who have often less context than even you do, right? So to make that, I think, work, you need to have where you have the end-to-end -end visibility of the system, um, step one, and step two, to have that culture where you're you know, giving the freedom and responsibility to empower uh, the people closest to the change to make decision about the change and make a change. Would you, am I paraphrasing that yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. But I have one last story. Oh, no, go ahead. Oh, so, uh, so uh, my area of passion right now is studying how large, complex organizations are transforming along DevOps principles, right? So, you know, the unicorns like Netflix are nice, right? But where the action is happening is in the horses, right? You know, people have been around for decades or even over a century. And, and, and the donkeys with carrots strapped to their noses. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and and I, it, it's difficult to overstate the uh, the enormity of the problem, right? You have organizations entrenched with decades of command and control, low trust cultures. And so uh, uh, I ran a conference called the DevOps Enterprise Summit, of which uh, Damon and Navian were on the program committee for. And they were the most amazing stories of like how Disney, Target, Macy's, US Department of Homeland Security are transforming. And one of the neatest stories was from Heather Mickman, one of the two people driving DevOps at, at Target. And she described how she got the Lifetime Achievement Award for polishing what they called the TEP LARB process. So uh, the, the TEP is a technology evaluation process, right? So it's like, well, if you want to bring in something new, you have to get on the agenda of the LARB, the Lead Architecture Review Board. And once you're in the LARB meeting, you have all the ops architects on one end, right? And you have the dev architects on the other. And then they'll argue with each other, right? And then they assign you a next you know, list of questions to answer. And she said, no one on my team should ever have to go through this. Right? But moreover, no one inside of Target should have to go through this. And when she asked, why is this process here, no one could actually remember. Right? There was some vague memory of something bad that happened right, 20 years ago, and that institutional memory and the bureaucracy still existed. And I thought that, that kind of bravery is, I think, is what it takes to implement DevOps in conservative organizations that you know, we, we do things the way we've always done. Yeah. I think the, the Nordstrom story is a, a good one from there as well. So Nordstrom's a pretty old organization, yeah. 100 plus years, right, retailer. And they, the, the summary of what they did was they stopped optimizing for cost and started optimizing for speed. And what they found when they did that was that the projects went so fast that they actually couldn't spend enough money to actually run, overrun the budget. So they ended up getting lower cost projects by but not by optimizing for cost, but by trying to clean everything out of the way. So it turns out if a project lasts longer, it will overrun its cost as well, and if you can speed it up a lot. So they went, you know, their speed up was a couple of orders of magnitude, maybe releasing once a day instead of once a quarter. So it's 100 times more frequent releases. The number of failures they had over that quarter, you know, production outages went down to some, do you remember the number? It was like a third or a quarter or something like that. And the success rate, the, how happy customers were with what they did, got went up. So it was, it was everything won. And so they did this in one project and went back to management who just did not believe the metrics at all and went and made to double check everything and says, this couldn't be possible. You couldn't possibly have got that much better across all these metrics in one go. He must have done it. It must have been a really easy, easy project. So they said, okay, the second project they did was deliberately chosen to be really, really hard. It was some point of sale system. I think there was 3270 emulation with screen scraping in the middle of it. All kinds of nasty stuff going on, uh, obsolete machinery and, and teams that had been doing that, this stuff for 30 years. And they went through the same process with them and they got a similar improvement with them. And at that point, the rest of them went, okay, I think this works, let's figure out how to just scale it everywhere. And, and, and you, then you get into the next step. And just briefly, to switch back to Target. Target had been pushing this for a couple of years. So I talked by them a, a few weeks ago where they said, okay, the problem now is management has figured out this works, and they're now saying, everyone do it. So now there's now 100 times as many projects trying to copy this one it's like small clump of people that are doing this stuff very aggressively. They're now trying to do a scale up on a couple of orders of magnitude without drowning it, without turning it into sort of process, you know, rote, like copying 
and trying to get the culture changes, which is, a, a, you know, that's kind of the problem of success, right, that they're struggling so with. So just to add some color to that, that Nordstrom story, where they did the, they had the one, pro, they had the one uh, area of improvement, they improved so much that nobody believed them, they had to, ch to choose a second one, the Adrian store was talking about. First thing they did was make the work visible. They got everybody in the room and they started value stream mapping, they started figuring out what does it actually take? What's the transactional cost to get from an idea out to production? And what are all the things that get in the way and cause it, cause it to take so long and, and cause us to, and why are we introducing, you know, where are the errors get introduced? Where does the context get lost? Where do things get, you know, get, 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 uh, get bogged down? So, you know, that's the first thing they did was get everybody in a room and make the work visible and start chipping away. So it wasn't a grand design or grand plan to start other than we're going to get everybody together, we're going to make the work visible, or use these uh, you know, value stream mapping in that, in that context, and start chipping away. And you know, those improvement programs start to steal back time. Right? As you find those improvements, you're creating more capacity to go find, to go find more improvements. And uh, you know, that's that snowball effect that, that uh, you, know, you said you know, Target and uh, Nordstrom, uh, or in reverse. Have, uh, have seen and are getting excited about. Want to get a word in edge race here? <laughs> yeah. That's all. <laughs> all right. Okay. So one, one thing that I, I think you've hit, like all like, the main points, I want to go just a little bit deeper on one thing that I think is, that I, I heard you say that I thought was really intriguing, intriguing to me. Um, so when you look at the processes that are in place today, I think we all agree that processes, to some extent, process is important. You do want to do. You don't want to do things that's going to put your firm at risk or put your um, someone's life in danger, right? So there's a there's a good amount of process that is good. I don't believe you're saying that process in general is bad and should just be getting rid of. And so in, in some of your experience, how have you helped that trade-off between, okay, this process is stupid. It's been around for 20 years for no reason. Versus, okay, this process is ties back to your HIPAA requirements. And so yeah. here's how you sort of adjust to model this new this new world. One of the things that drives me crazy about the, these DevOps unicorns, like <laughs> Netflix, Netflix and Ray, Roy Rappaport at Netflix. Uh, he said, uh, actually, let's go with Facebook. They said, um, our, first, our first value is people. Our second uh, thing that we value is technology and automation. And the, you know, way down below is process. Right? And I'm like, that's crap. Right? That's, that's, that's not true. Right? If you're doing tens or hundreds of deploys per day for a large scale property like you know, Facebook and you're getting good outcomes, you have a process. Right? If you count the number of controls that are act actually operating all the time in the code testing pipeline, in the, uh, you know, in the deployment pipeline, they have process. What they don't like is approvals. Right? And I think uh, whether it's Facebook or uh, Netflix, you know, they actually have a tremendous amount of process, but what they don't have are approvals. In fact, one of my favorite uh, stories I think you told me about was, you know, if you, I think Netflix, is this still running service now? So service now in Netflix is used for if you need a new laptop or <laughs> you lost your phone or you need, you know, some kind of so, to change your LDAP group or something like so that. Back that's, in the day. that's for corporate <laughs> IT stuff. It's not used for the So back in the day, uh, you know, they had used uh, service now for service catalog. And if you didn't, if any service didn't have an email address of, of a developer that could be escalated oh, to. Yeah, that's not with service now, but that's, yeah. Something else, right, right. They would kill the service. So it's like that's, in my, right, because it's better that you find out about, you know, unmanned services in a planned way than in an unplanned way in the middle of the night, right? And in my mind, right, that is exemplar as a process, but it has nothing to do with approvals. But, well, there's, so there's automation here. So, yeah, you know, all, all code is, is a process that somebody wrote code to do. And when you get an API-driven infrastructure, the, the, the process and approvals disappear because people just automate. So the pro, there aren't any written processes, there's just code that does stuff, and, and the way that code gets released by most of the teams at Netflix is that when you check code in, it goes through a build. And if the build succeeds, then it goes to, you know, they make a copy of this old microservice and then it goes through your test-driven development te stress tests. And they stress test it and they make sure that it's, you know, under load, it takes, they measure how long it takes to start and they measure its throughput. And if that succeeds, then it becomes a release candidate 
and it becomes a canary in one of the regions and it gets to run in production alongside the existing code and then they do a statistical analysis to see if it goes if it's significantly better or worse and if it's not worse then it becomes a release candidate it actually becomes the release and then if it works in that region for a few hours or overnight or whatever then they move it to the next region and if it works there they move it to the next region so they canary in each region this is a fully automated process and when they were putting it in place they said should we just like send an email to the developer to say like click here to say yes I want to go to the next step or should we just have it completely automate well, you know, I think we're completely automated because you know, if you check code in you've got to know that code's good enough to go to production that uh, automatic and it takes a few hours to get there and there are so many checks and controls and technically it's a process but it's a completely automated process there's no you know, written process book here. It's, it's just that everything becomes API driven, lets you automate it. And if you give developers an API driven system, they will automate all of the work out of existence. That's kind of the mentality, right? They will streamline it, they'll figure it out, and they'll work out how to make that process shrink until it's not there. Whereas the, the other sort of approach is if I have a process, I will write a, a run book and I will write it out in great detail and then people have to kind of be reading the run book. And that's, you know, basically in Netflix, the rule was no run books, write code instead. You know, Python code instead of run books was kind of all of the operational sequencing stuff. So Adrian, you had this thing I heard you talk about before about system, a system driven company versus a process driven company. Yeah. Can you describe that? I think that's the key thing. When we're saying there's no, you know, get rid of approvals or don't have these types of, of heavyweight processes, we're not talking about getting rid of controls. We're talking about building them into the system and having ownership, you know, yeah. aligned properly. Yeah. So I think that's a key differentiator. In other words, it sounds like anarchy. Yeah. Right? I mean, so Netflix that? has been SOX compliant on AWS for the last few years. They're now PCI compliant with their credit card vault on AWS. They're going through that process. So this can be this can be done, and that's with developers deploying directly with root access into those machines. So the way you do that is by segregating. Instead of saying there's dev and ops is the segregation, you have the general purpose stuff that doesn't need to be SOX or PCI compliant, and you let anyone do anything to that. And that's like 99% of actually the systems you're building. And it's all the personalization algorithms and things. There's still good hygiene in there, there's some auditing, there's key management, there's security at rest, there's things like that, but I didn't need to be audited. The SOX compliant stuff, it turns out, is you know, a few hundred machines, and there's a team of developers that specifically are permitted to work on that thing. You have to be in a different LDAP group, right? You are a different team. So the segregation is between teams of developers. And again, PCI compliant, you have to have a background check before you're allowed to access that system. So you've got these systems which are segregated by the type of system and you basically ring fence. The more secure it needs to be, the narrower and narrower and narrower it is. And you want it to be a tiny number of machines with a small number of developers and then on top of that, you have these compensating controls that everything is now 100% auditable because once you have a cloud system, whether it's you know, OpenStack or on AWS or whatever, you can get a complete audit trail of everything that happened there. Every API call is logged, everything that happens, every role change, every login, you get a full audit. So now you can actually continuously audit your system. Instead of just passing audit the one week a year that the auditor's standing there, you become continuously auditable and continuously monitored. So that's kind of the new model for doing this. It's a segregation is on a totally different axis. And you know, there's a bit of education for some of the auditors to teach them that this works, but that's kind of the way it's going. So it's not that you can't do these, these highly secure, highly regulated things. It's just that the way you do them is a little different. I, th I think that's a super, a, a super good point that was sort of kind of hidden in there is that it's not an all-in sort of thing. You could, um, actually our biggest commercial user base for our company is, is banks. Um, very likely credit cards you have in your wallet are our customers. And there, you know, that, that's sort of the peak of regulation is sort of finance and there's no real they haven't had any real problem. We're helping them get through, uh, and process as automation is a really important one. Process could be automated, approvals really can't. Um, so uh, automating that through, and the way we were able to do it was, what can you move quickly? And the way, for, for finance, uh, for banks, what we did was, um, their, their big batch processing jobs were the ones that they were able to move quickly because there was less regulation around that versus what was in the, the transactional hop data path. So we started with that team and it's sort of very similar to Nordstrom where it's just like look how much faster we were able to get through this one thing 
Um, and then the other team starts taking notice, and then, then it's what Damon said, which is just like, okay, well, what's in the way of us doing that? Um, and how does regulation, because it is legal, like how does regulation come in? Where do we force the regulation because we have to have it? And then the rest of the stuff, let's just automate it through and expose it as an API. So, and so you could do that partially. You could have one team that's, that's doing that thing and just making the other team jealous. And eventually it'll, I think, I believe that it'll win out, the better process will win out. So I'm going to go back to what Damon actually asked me earlier about systems versus processes. Netflix tries not to have processes, but they have systems. It's a systems thinking company, and it means that it's actually a bit fuzzy and a little bit ambiguous, and you have to kind of get used to that. But the general systems, the, the systems thinking approach means that at any point in time, people are following what looks like a process, but what they're actually doing is they're using their own judgment to get something done. And you know, if people have the same shared context and good judgment, they will tend to follow similar patterns. Now, when you copy Netflix, what you tend to copy is what looks like a process. It looks like, but what you're copying is an artifact of a system thinking. And it's a little subtle point, but what you tend to do as an enterprise is you upgrade your processes to some new thing, then you freeze on it. And then, you, and then you get more and more and more out of date. And then you have to switch to the new process. And it's a painful jump that you're making every time you're trying to change these processes. So Netflix has got a system. And the system, the goals of the system last much longer. And the processes evolve. So you're never making these big jumps from one system to another, from one process to another. Everything is evolving as the world changes around them. It's much more reactive and it's much, a, much more able to learn new techniques and figure out what to do. Uh, and there, there are you, books you on systems move. thinking. Uh, there's a book called, it's actually, it's a two books, one called Thinking in Systems, one called Systems Thinking. <laughs> that, uh, I'll put up, um, when I do my talk later this afternoon, I'll make sure I, I, I list those books. But there's, it's kind of fundamental to the way that you, you kind of organize you, yourself in, in, in a, and put things together. Even if, even if you don't go down a systems model, as long as you think about your processes as living, they're, they're not static. Right. They, they need to change with the, the regulations and the, 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 the technologies, that, as Mitchell brought up earlier. But it, it, they're, rel they're it, relies changing, on, right? it relies on one key thing, which is you have to trust the judgment of the people in the system. And it comes down, if you don't trust, I mean, there's a very high level of trust and judgment across everybody at Netflix. You kind of go to somebody you've never talked to and you're going to trust that, that given the right context, they will make the right decision. Whereas typically large organizations, a lot, there's a lot of lack of trust. Like those stupid guys in the other team, all of those kinds of things. And you don't trust the judgment of the rest of the organization. Well, the DBAs, so. Well, those, <laughs> those security guys, what are they doing? Those security guys. What well, do they know? So, so that, that's kind of the problem and that's why it's so hard to do. And that's another reason why this the, the reorg I'm talking about into ownership of a product means that really the people you're having to trust are the rest of your team and you've got a multidisciplinary team that's delivering a, a product over time and they build up internal trust even though there's a mixture of skills there and the other teams they don't need to trust because they're stable APIs. It's kind of like I'm writing a mobile app and I need a map. I call the Google Map API or the Apple Map API. I don't necessarily trust or know the people in those teams. They're just behind an API. But I can have an API to the people sitting in the cube next to me is the same thing. So you start building these microservice kind of ideas where everything is an API and that API is your stability and your trust and your SLA is sort of embodied in the fact that you have a stable API to all the other things you're, you're needing to deal with. So that's the kind of architectural model that fits the, the DevOps approach. We'll get into that a bit more later this afternoon. See, I think a lot of enterprises get stuck on this point because it's like, you should trust your people more. And they look at how they currently work today and the, the, the system, there is their organization, is set up is set up to be where they can't trust anybody because everybody's working out of context and doesn't have the uh, the freedom or the responsibility to drive the system outcome that everybody wants. So you've got, you know, if you've got five different networking teams making different types of changes in a uh, you know for interrelated services all deployed into the same environment, uh, you know, it, you end up to more of a low trust world because everybody's in their own isolated context 
d not aware of what everyone else is doing. We've got you know one logical change or one thing needs to get accomplished for an outcome gets divided up into you know seven different tickets across four different teams, and uh, everyone's working out of context. Therefore, mistakes happen, or misunderstandings happen, or you get a bunch of one-offs, and uh, you know so these bad things keep happening. So we trust people less. And we try to put more process in place and more and be more rigorous. Versus, I think if you build the system correctly, like you said, get everybody together who actually needs to drive an outcome, and you would trust them because you say, "Here's the outcome. I've hired the right people. I put them in a room, and I went and made it happen." Right? It's why I think startups are are, are more of a high trust environment because they know everybody is seeing the same thing. They're in the same communication pool, and they're making it happen. And I think the big trick for enterprises that want to transform is to build that context across the, the various functional areas so they can start to act more like a single a single system but you have to you have to drive that you can't just say in our current broken way of working I'm going to trust everybody yeah I, I have a sorry, question yeah. for this illustrious crew I mean one of the presentations that made a huge impression on me at the DevOps Enterprise Summit was from Gary Groover so he was the VP of quality engineering release and operations at Macy's and one of the uh, one of the problems that he characterized was, you know, every time we want to do a change, we have to synchronize and coordinate with 1,500 other developers because every one of the, you know, 1,300 backend systems are so tightly coupled that no one can make a change independently, right? In order to make one small change, we have to wait for 1,300 other developers to, uh, to uh, you know, catch up. And I think for global changes, like you know, DB, you know, database changes or uh, you know, networking changes, I mean, what is what are countermeasures you can do to decouple decouple those changes from everything else? Yeah, well, a lot of it is around not having global things. <laughs> <laughs> like the the, uh, the cloud native architecture. If you look at the Netflix open source things uh, like Pivotal and Spring Cloud is now incorporating a large amount of the Netflix code. So if you're a Java developer, go look at Spring Cloud, and there are easy ways to use the Netflix open source tools in your Java environments through what Pivotal are doing there. So it's actually a really interesting sort of approach. But you're, you're building stuff that goes really quickly. I mean, that's you're getting out of the way of people is really what it's about. Do you, do you guys have, a, a Mitchell, do you guys have any experience with helping cut companies kind of take the monolithic down to composable so services? Yeah, and it's it, 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 it's on two fronts, right? It's the whole, the whole notion, so there is architectural changes you can go, you know, you can try to drive, but I think it's also a bit of that Conway's Law interference, which is that organizations design their architecture of the system to look a lot like the communication structure and patterns of their organization and you see that so you get into a situation where we have siloed monolithic organization functionally siloed you know monolithic kind of organization that's in that's going to be building uh, functionally siloed monolithic applications and everybody got used to doing that and if you try to change just one of those things you're going to have this this uh, this dissonance between them right you're going to have if you try to just change the organization uh, you're going to be always be stuck in but we got this functionally siloed you know monolithic application so we're trying to act in this more decoupled way but we can't or if we just try to change the architecture, we're always going to kind of poison ourselves by going back to, but a org is not set up that way, so we can't parcel out the work in that way, so therefore we're going to always be driving back to it. So I feel like it's, you know, it's kind of a two-step process. One is, you know, making the work visible so people actually are working in the same context. But step two is you have to address it both what are the organizational dysfunction that's causing these artifacts that we see? How we work today is an artifact of how our organization is designed, as well as how is our application architecture and the technologies that we're using going to influence uh, what we can do as well. It's kind of a two-pronged yeah. two I mean, the, the Originally, the original Netflix DVD shipping architecture is a, you know, kind of a million-dollar IBM P7 machine with a million-dollar Oracle license on it. Kind of just to get your idea of the scale, it was a pretty big, I think it had 700 gigabytes of RAM or something, the last one that got built. So it's a monster, vertically scaled, monolithic app. And what we did was we picked off 
one function at a time, you know, one API call at a time, one web page at a time, and we re-implemented them one data table at a time. And each table in that massive schema, like an eight-year-old Oracle schema, becomes almost impossible to change anymore. Okay. It just gets so fragile. It was all PL SQL and everything. We just stopped trying to refactor it, and we just basically picked pieces off. And we created it. Each table became a separate data source in the cloud. So, that, so there was a sort of a, it's the strangler pattern is what they call it. So you add little bits and pieces and you gradually strangle the monolith with lots and lots of little services. It, well, it ended up being big services, but you know, you've ended up with this system that I think at its peak had maybe 10 million customers on the DVD business side, and it's now at 62 million customers on the streaming side. So, you know, it's scaled to be much bigger. And the streaming business is about 100 to 1,000 times more interactions per customer than the DVD business used to be. So the scale factor is hugely different. But that was the transition. It was picking it off one piece at a time. What we did was we had boot camps, and there was a bunch of people. Most of Netflix at the time we went to cloud were going, this is a stupid idea, this isn't going to work, um, back in 2009. And we took the group of people, and we took them in a room, and we went and we built something in the cloud so we really had hands-on experience. We got our hands dirty. We'd all deployed code. We'd built something. We built a little website. It was throwaway code, basically, but we'd done, we figured out what we needed to do. And then I went to another team, and I led a series of boot camps, about 10, 20, 30 people at a time, until we got through all of the engineering organization, and it became enough of a pattern that people could copy it. Yeah, and, and if I can give, a, I'm not sure if I ever told, ever, ever told Mitchell this, but give a shout out to the tools that his, uh, mm -hmm. he makes. Um, it, we actually had a, a large, uh, it was a large Cisco, uh, division of Cisco actually, I don't know if I can say it or not, but, uh, and they used particularly Vagrant and then the other tools around it to do those boot camps to show people what it should feel like. Like, if we're going to work in a cloudy, cloudy native way where we're thinking about continuous delivery, not just from an application perspective, but application and infrastructure, integrated, thinking about it, what would that feel like? And they used, uh, you know, Vagrant and uh, some of the other HashiCorp tools just to prove that, to get that going and say, okay, now that we know what that feels like, how should, how do we, what's the delta? How do we start to think about what does that mean for us? What would it take us to get our applications to work that way? What would it take to get our organization to think that way? What kind of structure we need to have? So, uh, you know, I know Mitchell's been a bit quiet, but to kind of give a shout out to the stuff that, that, that they do, um, you know, it's killer tools and you see cloud companies, you know, doing killer stuff with it. But I think as a way to sort of show people how does it all stitch together? And I think also, you know, Adrian's Netflix, the tools that Netflix put out there are good as well. But I just want to give Mitchell some props for that. Well, thanks. I, th I think what something we like to do, at least with a lot of companies that we go into, is a lot of times when we get called into a company, it's like, we've heard about you, we, we use some of your things here and there, but like, what is possible? Like, we have this thing and what is possible? And then every, like, every single person you ever go into is like, well, but we're, we're different, we're special. Like, right. we can't do it because we have this thing that's different. And so what we've built up internally, which we'd like to eventually publish publicly, is, um, is sort of a thing where it's like, well, give me the list of technologies you're using. So they'll start spattering out things that are, not, that are non-proprietary, at least, or that we could, if it's Oracle, we'll, we'll, for the purpose of a demo, we'll shuffle in Postgres or something. But it's like, give me the list of technologies we're using, you're using, and we have all the permutations basically in a repository where we deploy an application with exactly those technologies um, in that less than that one hour meeting you showed us, and we deployed a few times. And then they're like, okay, we're not that special actually. <laughs> and this, so then the next question becomes like, how is that possible? Like, how do we actually, okay, we see what's possible, just like Damon said, now what do we do? And, and I yeah. think a key difference from our perspective technologically versus some other newer tech in the space is all of our technology is very legacy friendly. So we like to say, okay, you have this monolith, let's get service discovery in there or something. And then our service discovery tool is console. And it's like there's, console uses DNS as the service discovery layer. Like I bet you your monolith supports DNS. So let's just deploy a modern cloud native sort of, a cloud being open stack physical. It could even be VMware, like consider that a cloud. Like it could be something physical, How deploy this distributed, <laughs> distributed application service discovery system that's very resilient, hook up your monolith to it, now you got that. Now when you pull off a piece of the monolith, it, it's talking through that system. You're slowly like, it doesn't, yeah. like I said, we don't like to view technology as a, 
he was very shiny, but you have to throw away everything you previously had because it's that's hard. Never worked. Um, we like to. We so, like, yeah. So instead of pushing the host's file to all your machines every day or whatever, yeah, you, you're using a service registry. So you know, yeah. one of those little files that you keep updating becomes a automatic lookup. Right, and that's right. like picking off a piece of it. So then you then you but then possibilities just start unlocking when you start doing that. So yeah. um, we like to view it that way. So, yeah, and, and that delta is always it's always process and culture issues more so than is technology issues. We yeah, this, right. You could. The technology stack you can make fly, but it's going to be the culture and get the end-to-end -end picture of what's getting in our own way in yep. order to really yeah. make it work. But it really comes down to how fast you can get something done and getting out of the way of innovation. Uh, a, a couple of other anecdotes. Somebody once I was talking to a group of senior managers and said, yeah, but Netflix has these superstar developers, and we don't. So we can't copy all that stuff. And I thought about it and said, yeah, but we hired them from you guys. <laughs> they were all, you know, this guy came from Comcast, this guy came from whatever. You know, so there were a whole bunch of companies that were in that room that I remembered that's where we got our engineers from. So you already had these people, right? That, and you were getting in their way and annoying them and not letting them do stuff. And they ended up at Netflix. And there's a combination here of that, what is this 10x developer? A 10x developer in a company that doesn't let you do anything is so wasting their time. <laughs> it turns out most developers or most, most engineers are underperforming because the system they're in is preventing them from doing it. And the whole point about a lot of the Netflix culture piece is to get out of people's way. And you get way more out of a, a, an engineer. And, and just looking around companies, I think, you, know, you, you, you develop stuff really quickly because I see the kind of things you produce. I mean, when you produce Vault, I went and looked at That's a lot of code. <laughs> <laughs> I was just re trying to read the code. I went, yeah, there's a lot of depth here. It's a fantastic. It, Vault is a, a key management, security management product that they came out with recently in open source. You can go look at it. it there's an awful lot of functionality there. So that's, they're obviously developing stuff really quickly. There's projects at Netflix where an engineer said, I want to go build this. And us old timers, we go, yeah, that sounds kind of ambitious. That's going to take too long. And we'd kind of tell them to hold off a bit. And eventually, we'd say, OK, go do it. And they'd come back in half the time we expected with something that was better than we expected. And that happened multiple times. That doesn't happen. That's not a thing that you normally expect to happen. But the calibration is different. And I still think that the ability for an engineer at Netflix to get something done is just industry leading. And whatever it is, you can get more done with fewer people in less time. And that is an incredibly powerful advantage that they figured out how to, how to institutionalize in, in that culture. And even if you copy a few bits of it, you're probably ahead of your competition. So Adrian bust one myth that you can't just change your QA team to a DevOps team. Yeah. Mitchell bust another myth that you can't just you know loop onto one set of tools and never change because software is always evolving, technology is always evolving, and your competition is always evolving with these new technologies. Uh, Damien bust a couple of myths around process and, and having to try to keep the process going um, by, by automating the process and not just you know, and, and getting the uh, the approvals out of the way. Um, I know uh, Gene really wants to make a couple points around kind of the, the network engineer and the role of the network engineer, especially being at a Cisco conference. And so I want to kind of end today with kind of Gene talking about that and, and give you guys all a chance to kind of get to weigh in. But the, the question is sort of like, how do you as a, as a network engineer professional, or as a CCIE, how do you look at DevOps and, and the opportunities it may give you in your career going forward? Yeah, I, I mean, maybe just to put some context on this. I, uh, actually, let me first state by some of the most well-trained, most experienced people I've known are CCIEs. I mean, I'll say that flat out in terms of just uh, the business context, architecture. You know, if I want to, you know, the exemplars typically were coming from, like, uh, they had in their resume a CCIE. So what, I had a conversation where, like, what, does this, what does DevOps mean to, you know, uh, highly skilled DBAs, the highly skilled network engineers, uh, server administrators? And, you know, I, uh, I think it's difficult to overstate the anxiety that some people feel that DevOps is going to automate everyone's jobs away, right? And, uh, you know, all of these functional specialties are going to disappear. But I guess the one story that I remember I was hanging out at Disney for uh, a couple of days. And I met a gentleman, he was like, you know, say 45, 50 years old. And uh, he said, three years ago, as a career server administrator, I realized that I had been relying on my large vendor partners, you know, whether it's BMC, CA, IBM, 
Cisco, VMware, whatever. I was relying on them for my career track, right? And if I, however, if I don't you know, take responsibility for this for myself, I risk irrelevance in a couple of years. And then got himself trained in all these new exotic technologies. And now he's helping train and onboard the next generations of ops engineers at Disney. And, and so I, I genuinely believe the, the best days of, especially operations, are ahead of us, not behind us. And there's never been a more fun time to be in the game. Uh, and so whether it's Docker, whether it's um, all these things that organizations are using to increase developer productivity, I think you know, that's any place you can take closer to developers' work, the better. And they can't do their work without operations people. I mean, I think I'll just uh, put that out as Gene's personal theory. Yeah. yeah I think I, it's, you, you tend to be firefighting a lot of the time in a lot of these roles. And you're basically, it's a series of trouble tickets and there's something broken, you've got to figure it out. The, the, the change you see is that that firefighting starts to go away because other people are responsible. Like if a developer runs, what, if, if a developer's on call for the service that he does, you're not on call for it. He's not handing it over to somebody else, particularly if they're deploying it five times a day. They can't have five meetings with ops to do the handover a day, it doesn't work. So when you get to continuous delivery, you run what you wrote. So that means that you end up spending more of your time developing tooling that's basically in your domain knowledge. So as a, as a networking specialist, you'd be developing tooling that would automate some of the networking stuff. And all those annoying things, those repetitive jobs, that were the boring part of your jobs, and the confusing firefighting, annoying, waking you up in the early hours kind of problems, those are the pieces that go away. And you get, you get back a better quality of life, but you end up also producing stuff. You end up producing systems and tooling and automation, and your value has shifted now as the owner and maintainer of a piece of automation. And the SREs at Netflix are like that. They build systems that monitor whether Netflix is running reliably, and, the, and those systems call the person that is responsible for fixing what broke. They are not on call to fix it themselves. Right, so that's, that is a switch in role, and it's a, it's a little bit more of a developer role, but the domain knowledge you need is around the operations and the tooling and keeping things reliable and the availability monitoring and measurement. Yeah, I mean, I'd just say that, you know, the point today of all these businesses is to run, so run services. It's operate services. Operations is the business. I mean, developers are essentially, you know, they're part suppliers. They're supplying the parts for the business. Uh, in fact, most organizations that they could buy all their software off the shelf, they, they, probably, they probably would. But operations is where the money is made and how the business happens. So the skill it takes to, to build and run large scale, uh, large scalable, you know, resilient services is only getting higher. So the demand for the knowledge of the people at this, at this event is, is, is going through the roof. Uh, I think what's changing is, you see these, these high performing organizations, they're getting out of the fact that people are working as, uh, you know, basically they're ticket taking firefighters, right? Their life's being driven by, by ticket queues and firefighting versus this new model that Adrian's talking about, which is you think more of myself as an operations engineer. I'm building services that, like a product, like my own, like own internal startup, that other people in the organization are gonna consume because I wanna stay out of their way. Uh, they need environments that work. They need, uh, you, know, um, you know, they don't need to be experts in making 13 different requests to different networking teams to, uh, to get something done. They need an environment that can talk to certain things, and that means they need to think more about a, a service provider creating products that others can use. And all roles of all types of of, uh, of roles are needed to make that a reality. But that's the big difference to me: what it feels like to work in sort of the classic enterprise, you know, where a bunch of ticket-taking repairmen and firefighters versus the, and uh, every once in a while get to pretend like we're engineers and do some cool things. Versus you look at these more high-performing organizations; they're designed to where uh, you're spending the vast majority of your time as an operations engineer, right? And we're building services that we can be proud of and uh, helping the organization succeed versus kind of always scrambling around being driven by a request queue. Yeah, Very good. Yeah, I, I like to say that, like, I mean, if, if for the people who are, like, insecure about their job with DevOps sort of stuff, it's, you know, we're, whether you're networking or storage or compute, like, we're engineers, like, it, we solve problems and we, we build things and, and by not firefighting we're actually like, I, I, it's sort of like the dream which is like we're instead just commanding a robot army to do whatever we want, right? So like as engineers you're actually building and commanding this future which is all 
computer-based. It's, it's, all of it is computers, and it's, there's no future where there's less computers. So it's, <laughs> the, the job's very secure. The role just shifts a little bit, and it gets more exciting because personally, I'd rather build a robot army than like <laughs> plug in yeah. things. You know? Absolutely. But uh, everyone, I, I know is uh, time is wrapped up. I've been asked to, to wrap up. So uh, would, would everybody please join me in, in congratulating and thanking our guests for, for joining us today. This is a very good topic. Um, each one of these guys has a presentation starting right after lunch, uh, one so 1 o'clock. And so if you can come back this afternoon, it, you're going to hear a lot more details from each of them in terms of what, what they've actually seen happen, how they've seen this happen, and, and some of the great um, advice that you heard today, well, you'll hear a lot more of uh, this afternoon. So thank it's, you for your time. It's in this order. So thank you, Ken. Order thank you, first, team. Right. Thank you. That's great. You know, what we do have, if you want to stay just for another minute, we have time for one or two very, very quick questions because we're running a little late with our next speaker. But let's go ahead and get one from here. That guy was ready. Bonus time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like there's something right. So I'm going to ask you guys, when does DevOps, microservices, all this new fancy stuff not make sense? Is there any use cases where a monolithic actually is the right solution? Or are you really true believers in DevOps, Microservices, all things. I, I those, are very the, I mean, those are very different things. You're talking about microservices. I mean, it's just in general. I, I, I don't know. I don't know a single. So the thing that I'm a believer in is outcomes, right? So time to market and quality matters in every business. Yep. So if you want more time to market and quality, look at DevOps as lessons to be learned, as microservices, as a design pattern. You look at it as different things you can apply to get based on how much investment you want to make. But what always matters is time to market and quality. So uh, DevOps is not like a one true way. It's an umbrella of ideas, an umbrella, uh, addressing an umbrella of problems related to this business need, which is go faster and have higher quality and you know better security. So yeah, I mean, in that, everybody needs that. So how much you apply and what the investment pattern is, is based on your, your company. But yeah. I, I don't know, anybody could say, you know, we don't need to go faster, we don't need to be you know, have higher I, I, quality. I, I think my, my approach, if you think about microservices, is what you're really doing is assembling Lego bricks and public APIs. Um, you know, if I need a web server, I'll get the Nginx container from Docker Hub, and if I need a, a, uh, you know, a search engine, I'll go and get the Elasticsearch one. And these are microservices. They all stand up separately. So in the modern world, you're Lego bricking together. You know, maybe you know, some large proportion of the thing you're building is just going to come as distinct services. And then in the middle of that, you have your own code base, which might be monolithic and might be like a Ruby on Rails app or something like that. But you have to be careful. Be and when you're first iterating and you're trying to build the new thing, it tends to be monolithic because you're still iterating. So brand new things tend to start as there's, if it's a small number of people building it. So if you've got you know, no more than five people, that's a monolith. You know, that is a monolithic app. Once you get to be tens of people, they should be. You know, you need to split things up so that you've got small teams working on separate pieces of it. If you can figure out how to build separate teams, then those should be the separate services. So, so that's all, that's the answer. All I guess answer it very directly, which I think that, and I, I think there might be some contention at least from Adrian, where I think that, I think no, like I'm not all in. Like I think that. As someone who builds some of the tools on the front line, like I think that the tools actually aren't all there yet to, to support just always diving in. I think the future is yes, like not even that far away from now, like max five years from now, I think absolutely yes, you dive in microservices every time. But I think today, I think there's still struggles you'll have that you won't have with a monolith. Um, and so from a purely pragmatic point of view, like feel free to do it, but understand that that's going to be debt that you're going to have to pay back later. Uh, but matters, outcomes matter. Do you want it done faster, or do you want it done more future-proof? But you're you're going to pay also some costs up front of the tools not being completely the, the ecosystem's not completely solved yet. Okay, Ken, um, Dave, uh, Gene, Adrian, Mitchell, thank you very much for your time. We'll see all these gentlemen a little bit later on. Thank you.